churches and in church administration. And so the assignments that are given are to make you think about those challenges within the context of a particular church, right? So the student is expected to participate in field research by selecting a congregation with which to observe. So in other words, I want you to select the congregation. It could be the congregation that you are currently worshiping in or that you are an officer in. It's easy if you're an officer or you're an elder or something in the congregation because you're already embedded. Um, or if you don't have a local congregation that you are embedded into or you want to choose another one, you may choose another one. But what I would like for you to be doing during this semester is to take what you are learning and observe it in practice within your local congregations. So I want you to learn how to see your congregations through fresh eyes, to look at them slightly differently, to be able to reassess them and to assess what is going on in those congregations based upon some of the things that we talk about, some of the things that we read and some of the things that we explore. Um, along the way, I'll be dropping um, some more course information in as we go along. Um, as I told you, was it last week that uh, this course was previously taught by someone else and I was going back and reviewing certain things. There's some things I think that we could add that could uh, help to sort of round out the experience and make it a little bit more applicable. I do want to spend a little time um, um, that is not currently not on the syllabus, but we will spend some time also talking about budgets and strategy for implementation of budgets because those are critical to administration as well. But I want you to start um, identifying a church with which you will operate in over the course of this semester and you will be doing your field research there. So the student is expected to receive written permission from the pastor to review and to observe church operations including a board meeting, a departmental meeting, and a finance or treasury meeting. So here is that first assignment. The student shall select a local congregation for field observation for this course. The student shall, number one, obtain a statement of support from the local pastor. Um, and I believe there is an example, I'll, I'll shoot you one. You can, you can just have him uh, give you a a note saying that he agrees uh, to allow you to observe. During this course, you should get permission from the pastor to observe church operations, including board meeting, department meeting, finance, and treasury. The student shall select a local congregation for this course, obtain a statement of support from the local pastor, collect and report the demographics of the congregation. Now, do we all understand what demographics are? Do we understand that? Or do we need a brief explanation? Well, demographics are the basic raw data that uh, describe a population of people. So for example, the demographics would be the age of the population. So if I'm looking at a church, I wanna know, hmm, is this a Mount Rubido church in California? And if you go to Mount Rubido church, it tends to be a youth and a young adult church. So most of the people who attend Mount Rubido are probably uh, under the age of 50. So it tends to skew young and probably the average age in that congregation might be about 30 years old, right? So they have some young people, some young families, but it tends to skew quite young. There are other churches that you may think of or may be involved with that tend to skew quite older, where the uh, population tends to be, you know, above the age of 50, or some churches are even senior citizen churches. So demographics, think about the age of that congregation. Uh, find out as much as you can about that age, perhaps by talking to the church clerk or talking to the pastor, you may get a sense of the age of the people who are sitting in the pew. The household size and type of that congregation so um, is it a church primarily of single parents? Is it a church that has a lot of married couples? Are they young married couples, old married couples? Is it a multi-generational church where you have several 
of people who are living in the same household throughout multiple generations, more than likely, you will find multiple generational households when you look at immigrant communities, because when people first come to the United States, they often will pool their resources together, sometimes sharing an apartment and sharing resources in order to get a leg up. So you see that multi-generational households in um, those types of communities. So ask yourself the question, what is the household size and type? What is the general income of those people who are in the church? Does it tend to be a blue collar church or a white collar church, right? And how much do people earn? Uh, one of the things I discovered during the COVID crisis that my congregation, although we have a lot of white collar people, we have a whole lot of people who are gig employees or who are working the gig economy. And so right now, as the money is no longer flowing, they're no longer working. So we have a major food insecurity crisis. So you know, knowing what the income is and those kind of things will help you to think about ministry differently and whether or not the church is responsive to the needs of its population. Right? The educational attainment is also something that we look at in terms of de demographics. Are they highly educated or not highly educated? Right? What's the highest level of education that tends to be in that church? And then what is the ethnicity? Ethnicity is not the same thing as what we call race, right? Race is a social construct, it really doesn't exist. Ethnicity is a better term to describe how people think, look, act, respond, um, coalesce together around a particular culture, right? That is called ethnicity. So for example, just because all people happen to be black doesn't necessarily mean that they have the same ethnicity. Uh, I'll give you an example, which may seem quite extreme to you, but it's a good example as far as I'm concerned. I happen to have been born in Boston. I'm Boston born and Boston bred. If luck runs out, I'll be Boston dead. <laughs> you know, that's just way it is. I was born and raised in the Northeast. But I went to a school called Oakwood College down in Huntsville, Alabama. When I was down there at Oakwood College in Huntsville, Alabama, I saw this woman. She appeared to be an angel who had yet to sprout her wings. I found myself mesmerized by her deep, dark eyes, warmed by her winning ways and bedazzled by her dazzling smile. And when I held her next to me, my heart was filled with ecstasy. I was in love, right? And I ultimately ended up marrying that girl. That girl happened to have been from a small town in Georgia called Albany, Georgia, population of about 120,000, Albany, Georgia. Now it's down to about 75,000. But I married this girl from Albany, Georgia. And I soon discovered that even though we are both African Americans, both born in this country, both have two sets of African American parents and grandparents, that we actually come from a very, very different culture. So my Northeastern culture is not the same as her Southeastern culture. She had to learn my culture like, like, like I had to learn her culture. I even had to learn her language and the language of her family, which is different from the language of my family. And so ethnicity sort of goes there. So um, in uh, the Northeast where I currently pastor, we have American congregations and we have West Indian congregations. Or sometimes we have a mixture of Americans and West Indians in the congregations. Um, right now, the church I pastor happens to be about 95% Jamaican and about probably about 5-6% Antiguan. Those are uh, all black people who've got the same skin color. But if you talk to them, you realize that the nuances of their culture is different. So... That's what I mean by ethnicity. So don't just tell me it's the church for the black people. I want you to break it down a bit and find out if there are some nuances there that may impact ministry. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. Describe something about the history of the church as well. Um, when the church was founded, right? The size of the church at its founding. What's, what's the story behind the church? How did it get there, you know? Would it arise out of a crusade? Did some literature evangelist come by one day and threw some pamphlets on the ground and all of a sudden the church sprang up, right? 
what are the significant events in the history of this church? Because I want you to understand, you know, how the church came to be. I want you also to describe the ministry context of the church. Is it urban? Is it rural? Is it suburban? Is it upscale? Or is, or is it impoverished, right? So where is it located and how does that impact, you know, its, its ministry context? I want you to take just a little moment also to describe the leadership core, the size of the board, the departments that sit on the board, and the experience of the treasury team. As we go through the course, we'll talk a little bit about boards and how boards are structured. But uh, for right now, just describe the size of the board. It'll be interesting for you to, to think about this. I went to uh, one church. The church had uh, 33 members. My first uh, church had 33 members. And out of the 33 members, there were probably about 20 of them that were sitting on the board. <laughs> so, you know, then you have some other churches. I had a church that had, that had uh, what is it, uh, 1,800 members. And they, the board was uh, 56 persons, 56 persons. So you can imagine trying to have a board meeting with 56 different opinions in the room. So look at the size of the board, the departments that sit on the board, because it may be different from church to church, and also the experience of the treasury team. If you have a treasurer, does that treasurer have a degree in accounting? Does the treasurer have a business background? What does the treasurer know? How long has the treasurer been doing it? Because that's interesting as well. And also from your treasurer, you can also find out some things like the annual tithe of the church. Pastor can probably tell you that. And also the annual budget of the church. So. What I want you to do is just get a good snapshot of the church that you will be observing throughout the semester, right? Get that snapshot. Understand what you're looking at. Because as we talk about different models of evaluation for the church, as we look at different ways to assess a church, I want you to be thinking, how do I apply this assessment? How do I apply this information? to this particular church and this particular ministry context. A question so, for you, Doctor. A question for you. Yes. So the first point is uh, to obtain a statement from the pastor. Like in my, my case, I'm, I'm the first elder. Do I still need to get a statement from the pastor? Yeah, just all you, all, all you want from the pastor is just for him saying, yes, you know, I, I recognize that, uh, that, that Uber is a student and I'm giving him permission to to uh, to uh, obtain information from the church. That's okay. that's only because at the end of the day, we don't want someone coming back to us and saying, "Well, you put these people in our churches, and we didn't know that they were here, and they was going around collecting information." So it's just a way of including right. the pastor in the process. Most pastors will be happy to do this, knowing that you're that you're working on a degree. So it's not it's not going to be a problem. If it is a problem, just let me know if any of you have problems with your pastors, because I'll be glad to call them and explain to them what we're asking them to do. Um, so we don't really um, have a formal field agreement. I think that's something that the School of Religion is probably gonna be working on soon. Uh, we don't have a formal agreement for that, but if you just let get him to say, yeah, okay, you can do that. Just write, okay. write a note, you can email it or whatever to you. You can email it, forward it to me, whatever. It's okay. not, not, not a big deal. Sure. Thank you. All right. Any other questions on that? Okay. Well, I want to take a look just for a moment then at your final project. Okay. Because your final project is to be a summation of the information learned and application of the principles toward a ministry project. So during the course of 15 weeks, you would have had an opportunity to observe your church. You'll have an opportunity to look at the leadership style of the church, the policies of the church, and the practices of that church in light of our discussions. Right? You will have described during the assignments that are given to you, your application of the principles to church leadership and church program. Each one of the assignments that are given are asking you to um, assess something about the church in light of the presentation. So 
the lecture doesn't stand alone. The, the assignment that goes with the lecture requires you to go back to that church and think differently about that church. And say, well, listen, we talked about the four quadrants, which, which we will talk about today. And um, after we talk about the four quadrants, then your assignment comes after that, where you will go back and apply that to your church. And we'll talk about that assignment after the presentation so you can see the, the linkages there for, uh, for you, right? So this project that you're gonna be working on is gonna be presented in two forms, right? First, it'll be a written document in no less than 10 pages, and second, in a PowerPoint to be presented at the end of the semester. The presentation should be no more than 20 minutes um, in length, should be in length, excuse me, and should summarize your findings, proposals of what you have learned in the process. In this final project, listen to this, you will conceive a ministry project for your church under observation. So what I want to do in this class ultimately is to say, all right, I, I learned this and I learned that, I learned this about a mission, I learned that. So what if I were to conceive a ministry project for this particular church? Because now I understand the church. I understand its history. I understand its demographics, its age, its income. I understand its leadership style. And now I can see it a little bit more clearly. Now, if I were going to create a program or a ministry for this church, what would it look like? What would it feel like? And I want you to be able to take into consideration these things when you are designing your ministry project for this particular church. I want you to be able to justify why this project was, was chosen. So I want you to state the mission of your project, the goals, and the timetable to meet the goals. So we're going to use SMART goals. Some of you know what that means, right? right? Uh, specific, measurable, right? Um, achievable, relevant, and time-bound or time-sensitive. We'll talk about SMART goals, but I want you to think about your project in terms of some realistic goals that could be accomplished in a reasonable timetable that are relevant to that ministry context. I want you to take into consideration the demographics of the church, the organizational structure of the church, the departments or part of the organization which would oversee your project. So for example, I have a ministry program in my church right now. Uh, we started with 50 people in uh, over the last two years. In January, we were feeding 50 people. Now we have nearly 500 families per week since the pandemic, right? The ministry sprang up. Now I've got volunteers I have to look at. Now I have budgets I have to look at. Now I have to figure out where does this fit? Does it fit in community services? Does it fit in personal ministries? Does it fit in health ministries? Should I keep it in the pastoral portfolio? Those are the kinds of questions that I have to think about administratively. So as you are creating a project, think about where it fits in the organizational flow. Who is going to be responsible? What department is going to oversee this? Is there some sort of overlap between that and another department? What organizational approvals will be needed? So is this just something that one person can do on their own or do they need a vote from the department? Do they need a vote from the church? Will it require them to have a vote from the board? Will it require conference approval? Will this project require approvals from the city or some other external agency? So I want you to think about that as well, right? Because in administration, you just don't do things, you follow the steps to achieve the ultimate goal. Then I want you to develop, um, excuse my, my type, I'm the worst typist in the world, develop an organizational flow chart and describe the various administrative roles and responsibilities. So in your org chart, who leads this, right? Where are the assistants? What are their roles and responsibilities? And I want you to give them a job title and a job description so that at the end of the day, you'll know exactly what they do and who they report to. Because one of the things in administration that makes administration useful and helpful is when there's a clear organizational flow chart and the lines of distinction are clear, the boundaries are clear, and the roles and responsibilities are clearly outlined. 
So does it compete, overlap, or replace an existing uh, project or department? Then I want you also to think about drafting a simple budget. We're not going to get into, uh, you know, I'll teach you some things about how to read some financial statements, but we won't get deep into uh, the, the financial statements. You'll learn about financial statements. You'll learn what a, what a balance sheet is and those kinds of things so that when you are presented with those, you'll know what you're looking at and why it's important, okay? So we'll look at some of those things. I'm not asking you to be an accountant, but I will be asking you to draft just a simple budget of income and expenses because you need to know if you're gonna run a ministry project, where is the money coming from? So often people start projects and they have no idea in the world how they're gonna fund it. And we've all seen this happen in churches before. People jump out there and they get into something and they're halfway through it and there's no money. They come back to the church for money. The church says, we don't have money. And then the people who are leading the project are mad with the church because the church is not giving them money and they can't see that God is blessing. Well, it didn't factor into the church's budget and the leaders of the ministry never calculated where they were gonna get the funding from. So if you're gonna have a successful project, you need to have successful funding as well. So I want you to describe those sources of funding for your budget. Then also describe who shall manage, oversee, and account for the distribution of the funds. Who's gonna count? Who's gonna write the checks? Who's gonna make sure you keep it straight? I've learned that if you can't keep it straight in a small operation, you will not be able to keep it straight in a large operation. Some churches jump out there and they want to write grants and get big grant money coming in from government sources. Once you do that, know that every time you take money from an external source, there is an audit trail that follows you. And so you need to start thinking about that even before you start thinking about spending money, right? How are you going to account for it and distribute it? What leadership style, administrative principles did you choose for this project? And why did you choose them versus some other style or principle? And what are the challenges in implementation, funding, or in funding your organization? What are some of those challenges you're gonna face? So don't just give me the pie in the sky. Oh, two years from now, we are going to be, you know, educating 555,000 young people. Okay, well, all right, that may be nice, but Aren't you going to experience some challenges along the way? What are those challenges? You ought to be able to think two or three steps down the road to anticipate the challenges that you're going to face and then plan for those challenges. So I want to know that you can think that way. And then at the end, what have you learned in the process of working on this project? So I said a mouthful, but do you understand what I'm saying to you? Any questions? It seems like a very interesting project, you know. I guess there's so much we need to get our hands around, but um, it looks um, like a great learning opportunity. You know, I guess when we're done at the end of the semester, I guess we'll be able to have some tangible results from this project. So, yeah. Great. Look forward to it. And uh, I, I will explain this to you as well. One of the reasons why I am having you do this project is um, some of you will be taking Dr. Bird's class on um, community um, development. There's another class to be in the urban ministries or in community ministry in the Adventist tradition. Uh, and then, of course, there is your final projects. If you're thinking now about all the details, the small details, when you finally get to writing that final project for your graduation, you're already down the road. You know, you're already, your brain is already in gear. So that I want you to start thinking of these things as second nature. So as you take future classes, you do it through this framework. And as you think about ministry, you do it through the frameworks that we've discussed. Okay. Question. Yes. You said you already have this post-it. It should be, it should be in the syllabus post-it. Is it, or, or. Because I, I just pulled it up from the website. Let me see. Let's see. Let's see. Where did you come from? Oh, I 
just squeak out of it. All right. I think. I think. Yeah, the only syllabus that I see on on there is it. It looks like it's not oh. an an up to date syllabus. Yeah, it's not enough. Well, you know what? Here is. Let's see. Give me the table of contents. So you are not seeing what I saw, right? No. I'm not. I go to table. Uh, I go to. Uh, I go to table of contents that I go to, to where the syllabus is, and, and it's actually it's popping up like on the second page, not on the very first page. Right. All right. Well, let me tell you where you can also find this. If you go to. One, two, three, four. sure that I get my technical assistance to make sure that thing is posted where it needs to go. Because when I pull up the syllabus, all it gives me is what I'm supposed to do each week. Right. I don't know if anybody else is pulling up different than I am. I don't know why. Okay. Yeah, that's the same thing that's popping up on my end. The uh, weekly calendar, which says week uh, August four, says quarter model. Mm -hmm. All right, I will, I will fix that ASAP. Is the quadrant model, doctor, uh, is the same as the four frame model PDF that's on there? No, it's not. Okay. It's, it's, it's different. Okay. Um, the quadrant model is really checking, it's, it's also called checking your vital signs. So. Okay, I'll have to fix that for you, okay? I will get that if, if, because if I can't, Drop it in here like I need to. I just make sure I email it to you, okay? So that you make sure that I make sure that you have that because you gotta have that. Is the quadrant model a PowerPoint we have to look at, or is it a PDF? Yeah, file? it's a it's a PowerPoint. Okay, yeah, because that that we probably would need that also. It's not on here. That's not on there on the week one. No. When I go to content, let me see. I see the title of it, but it won't open up in PowerPoint. It's not opening in PowerPoint. Yeah, it says checking your vital signs PowerPoint. When we click on it, it's empty. It's just a title, but there's no PowerPoint. <laughs> Come out, thou we'll, unclean we'll, spirit. We'll, we'll get through it, Dr. Blue. We'll get through it. <laughs> We just want to make sure that we have the material so we can work. <laughs> no, I want to make sure you do need the material so you can work. <laughs> oh, man, mercy. She's alive. Okay. Let me see what I
I think my assignment is going to be fairly easy because my our church is only like eight years old. So. Should be that hard. Week one assignment. Oh, where's the, where's the, this is? This is horror of horrors. All right. Let me go back into D2L real quick. Now it's saying my session has failed. Go back into D2L. It has failed. So, you know what? Someone told me that uh, I'm working on a Mac. Maybe our I see that we have discussions in every week. Uh, what are the discussions are going to be about? They're going to be about the um, the presentation that I'm trying to get here for you. Okay. Yeah, I, w I went through this entire page, Doctor, and everything is like generic. It just needs to be filled in with the classes and materials. That's what it looks like. And I'm not finding very much active for the weeks either. You, you see um, an assignment or something, and then there's nothing there. Yeah, that's what I said. It's like a generic page, and it has to be filled in and put the stuff in there. Uh, you know why? If you go in, like, for example, if you go into, let's go to week one real quick. Week one, okay. Week one, it is, I don't even see it in here. If you go into uh, Dropbox assignment. On week be... one? Yeah. Okay, I see it. Hmm. So there's something on there. Did I put something on there? You want us to go into Dropbox assignment? Yeah, go to, go to uh, Dropbox assignment. Yeah, I'm in there for week one. Week one, Dropbox assignment. Okay, it's on week one. Yeah, it's in, it's in the Dropbox assignment. It, 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 it's showing like someone dropped it in the in the Dropbox. That's what it shows like. Like when in the drop Dropbox? It, yeah, it's like when you drop something in the Dropbox, that's what it's showing like. I clicked on it and I saved it, and it's the assignment one. It's what the doctor right. just showed us. I had to go back in. So when I go into Dropbox... You have to go into the uh, Dropbox for week one. And correct. Week, week, one, week one, one Dropbox assignment, click on that. Yes, and you'll see assignment one doc. Just click on it and download it to your folder. And when you yeah, open it, yeah, I don't, it, I don't see it on mine. Hmm? You don't see it? No, I went into Dropbox assignment. Is week one W one Dropbox assignment? You don't and see where it says instructions, add assignment information, or delete. Then right below it says assignment one. You don't see it? In Dropbox, no. Yeah. Oh wow, I see it. I just downloaded it. It's just I what see the, it. it's just what the doctor uh, just tell, told us here. There's six bullet points, right, doctor? That's what I'm looking at here. Yeah, because I, I go 
Sifre goes to Dropbox under all the folders for each week. Week one, Dropbox assignment, I click on that. Right, like if I'm going to submit an assignment. Okay. Mine is just blank. It's blank. Do you want me to share a screen? I see the same thing as Daniel. I can send it to you, uh, over. Yeah, if you want to email it to me, yeah. You know what? I'm gonna, what I'll do is I'm going to email you all of these assignments because, uh, like I'm saying, uh, I'm not certain. They, you know, they switched. They switched slightly the format as to how they were setting this up before. It went to the folders in a slightly different way. So it may not be you. But it's probably me. In terms of the way this thing is is set up, so I will. I'm, I'll email you the, um, the syllabus as well as these assignments. And then I will uh, work with the technical people to make sure that I have this um, this thing set up correctly. Okay. Okay. My sincere apologies to you because here I am feeling all good about myself. <laughs> so, so Dr. Blue, um, uh, as as I see the assignment with with the with the bullet points, do we just under the bullet point answer each question and leave leave the question on there, right? Is that correct? You don't have to answer them question by question, but I, I mean, you can you can do it in a narrative form, or you can answer a question by question. Um, the main thing I have to do is, is to think about what you're writing, you know, to give some thought to it. Okay. So even though I'm only asking for a couple of pages, you know, those couple of pages may make you think for, uh, you know, a half hour or 30 minutes or so as you are, you know, choosing to write it. Says time okay. twelve points uh, double space. Yes. Okay. All right. So, so let, let me get into um, this lecture for you here. I'm so checking your vital signs and I will. Um, the assignments are due Sunday, Monday, or what? When are they due? Like, let me explain. Explain this. In terms, in terms of these assignments, um, the assignments have, um, according to the syllabus, due at the end of the week. However, I do understand that students are busy. My main thing is just get them done. <laughs> just get them done and turn them in. So, so that, that way, way, you know, I know that um, you're, you're thinking about what we're talking about. So, it's, you know, in, in, in every class, the assignments are there, not really um, so much for the teacher, but for the benefit of the student. So if you're keeping up, you can get maximum benefit. The other thing I tell students all the time is, students are oftentimes worried about grades. You know, grades are only, they only exist in the minds of people. Grades also tend to be very, very subjective. Um, if I know, for example, that a student is, is learning and they are demonstrating that learning by their class participation and getting the assignments, and that's all I need to know. You understand? I'm not there to, to, uh, to make sure that you have um, necessarily um, mastered all things, because you can't master all things in 15 weeks. You just can't do that. But I am interested in knowing that you are keeping up and that you are incorporating and thinking about principles. So check in your vital signs. This, this presentation, um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the, what I call a four quadrant model. Uh, and this four quadrant model is a way of assessing a church to see how the church is functioning. Um, and it gives you a paradigm through which you can look at churches. So we want to start here with first Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. And it says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves or do you not realize this about yourselves that you are 
that Christ Jesus is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Examine yourselves and test yourselves. Deuteronomy says, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. Take heed to thyself. In other words, examine and test yourselves. You know, one of the things that we have to do continually is check ourselves in the mirror to see what we look like. Uh, one day I walked out the, out, the, out the door back in the days when big afros were in vogue. I had a huge afro. And every night I used to braid my hair just so I could blow my afro up large in the, in the next day. But I walked out the door and I just knew I was looking good. I had two big old braids stuck in the back of my head because I hadn't checked myself in the mirror. We have to examine ourselves. Examine yourselves to see whether or not you were in the faith. When you go to the doctor, the doctor examines you to see if your system is healthy and whether or not you are balanced. Right? And the numbers and other factors can often be indicators of health. Your blood pressure, your oxygen level, your respiratory rate, all these are indicators of health. When a system is in health, the system is in balance. And when the system is out of health, then the system is out of balance. So what is health? The World Organization says this. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. It's not the absence of disease, but it's the presence of mental, physical, and social well-being. So just because you're not sick, it doesn't mean that you're healthy. Just because you're not manifesting the disease, it doesn't mean that your system is strong. In the same way uh, as we look at COVID, just because you don't have uh, overtly the symptoms, it doesn't mean that you're not sick internally and that you're a carrier of the disease. And so it is that we have to find ways to check our health and health is balanced. Now, if I was going to ask you, is this man healthy? What would you say? Doesn't look healthy. <laughs> Doesn't look healthy. Why do you say that? Why? Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. Why? Why is he? Why is he he looks excessively muscular. It's like a strain on his heart, his organs. This is this is clearly out of balance, right? Yeah. This is clearly out of balance. Health is, 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 is balance. And when we are out of balance in one way or another, it affects our health. And so there are vital signs in our body that help to determine the health. There's also vital signs in the church. Is this healthy? No, All right? All right? Some people are too thin. That's not healthy either. Health is balance. And so health requires balance in our body. And when Jesus Christ made us, he made us as balanced individuals, balanced human beings. The Bible reminds us that he breathed into us the breath of life and we became a living soul. And when we came forth, God created us as mental, physical, social, and spiritual beings, right? And all of those things were supposed to be in balance. And the fingerprint of God is upon that which he has created. And so if the fingerprint of God is upon us, what is that fingerprint? If we are created in the image of God, if we bear the likeness of God, if we are to represent God and what we say and what we do and how we operate, what is that fingerprint? Well, that fingerprint is the balance of the spiritual, the social, the physical, and the mental. When all of those things are in balance, then we are healthy. So you can't really be balanced uh, spiritually if you're out of balance mentally. And if you're out of balance socially, then you will often find yourself out of balance uh, physically and in the other areas of your life. So if I decide, for example, that I'm going to go on a fast and not eat for for 25 days, what do you think is going to happen to my mind? I'm going to start grow, growing delusional, right? If, if I'm out of balance socially, then 
I often find myself in situations that compromise my spirituality. So all of these things are designed by God to be in balance. And I call this the fingerprint of God. If it is the fingerprint of God, then we ought to see these things in balance in everything that God does. If it's this way in the microcosm of the human body, it ought to be this way also in the macrocosm of human organization. We are mental beings and intellectual beings. We are physical beings. We are social beings. And we are spiritual beings. And when we are out of balance, then the whole system is out of balance. There is an interrelationship, therefore, in the spheres of our existence. They depend upon each other. And what happens when one sphere is out of uh, balance? What, how does it affect the others? If I'm not spiritually balanced, do you think I can be socially balanced? No. Well, I have a healthy relationship with people if I don't have a healthy relationship with God. No. Health requires balance. If I don't care for my body, what happens to my mind? And if you don't know it, everybody else around you knows when you are out of balance. When you're out of balance, People can see it. They know. Right? Sometimes you yourself can feel when you're out of balance. Things are not right. Like my boy here, Fred Sanford. When he's out of balance, he always has the big one, a heart attack. Right? Elizabeth, I'm coming home. Right? When we're out of balance emotionally and spiritually, it affects our health. Depression, right? is a major risk factor for heart disease because what happens in the mind also affects the body alcohol as we consume alcohol to soothe our depression it also has impact upon our physical being and so any addiction whether it's food or drugs or work or sex is an indication of a life that is out of balance even church can be an addiction. It can be a sign to us that we're out of balance. Have you met some people who all they do is church all day long? All they do is church. They can't think of anything else but church. Women can go to church all day long and praise God and come home and look at her husband like, you know, what are you doing? Oh, man, is always serving till the late hours of the night, clean the church and has no time for his family. Even church can be an addiction. And even going to church can put us in a state of being out of balance. So here's a lady who knows how to do church. You know when you say you can make this kind of face, that's a whole evil face. Right? Balance is what we're trying to achieve. So what are the vital signs of church health? Well, the fingerprint of God is upon all human activity. Just like there has to be balance in us for health, Right? So it is that there has to be balance in the church for health. And so this balance in the church and in human organizations follows the model of the microcosm that transpires in the human body. And the human body have to have mental, physical, social, and spiritual well-being. So it is in a organization, in order for it to be healthy, it must have worship, fellowship, stewardship, and discipleship. And those things have to be in balance. Worship, fellowship, stewardship, and discipleship. I say, when you take a look at a church, you will discover that there is no activity that takes place in any church, anywhere, at any time, that does not fit into one of these categories. Worship, fellowship, stewardship, or discipleship. And in order for that organization to be healthy, all of those things must be in balance. For worship in the uh, body of Christ is that spiritual development. Fellowship is that social development. Stewardship is the physical and discipleship is the mental. Now, people can usually see worship the spiritual and fellowship the social, but why do I say that stewardship is the physical development? Why is stewardship the physical development? Why is that the arena of physicality? So 
somebody, anybody. Does it mean because you're getting involved into the activities of the church in a sense? Because you, um, you're having to return the tithe, you're having to give up your time and your talents and all of that to God and oversee what God has given to the church or given. Yeah, okay. I think, all right. I, I like that. I like that. I like that. I like that a lot. Somebody else. Yeah, I think because as pastors, we actually take care of the church. You know, we're supervising the church. Would that qualify or? Yeah, it, it does. does. It, it does. does. It does. See, See both, both of you are actually correct because stewardship is the guardianship of that which God has entrusted to us. Right? Right. Stewardship is the guardianship and wise management of that which God has entrusted to us. So in the realm of stewardship, we are managing God's earth. We are managing God's resources. We are managing the, 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 the physical reality that is around us. That's our responsibility as wise stewards. What about discipleship? Why is discipleship in the category of the mental? Discipleship. Hmm. Anybody here know um, anything about um, uh, what that word, the root of that word is? Disciple. Discipleship. Can, can you be discipline. Discipline. All right. Discipline, right? Discipline doesn't mean exactly what we think it means today, where you get a spanking when you're bad, right? Discipline actually comes from a, from, from a root word that actually been teaching and training. Discipleship is about training. So discipleship in this mental arena is about the training of the mind and the developing of the individual to have a broader perspective, but that perspective is guided and directed in a way that brings the individual to a fuller development. So in church, you've got to have worship, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or it's not church. Right. You've got to have fellowship, right? Because if all you do is worship all the time, you become a bunch of monks, right? And nuns, right? So you got to have, right? We need an interaction. we got to have stewardship because somebody has to be responsible for taking care of that which God has entrusted to us. And you've got to have discipleship because that's the only way that the church will perpetuate and go on. There has to be the discipline and the training and the ongoing development so that the church becomes self-perpetuating. Right? So worship, fellowship, stewardship, and discipleship. And all of these right, keep a church balanced. So it is that a church has to be balanced to be healthy in these four quadrants. And they are, sharing with me right now, because I don't want you to get this. They are worship, fellowship, stewardship, and discipleship. Worship, fellowship, stewardship, and discipleship. Don't forget it. Worship, fellowship, stewardship, and discipleship. Look at this. All right? This is so sweet. Worship is my encounter with God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Fellowship is, is my encounter with you. Stewardship is my responsibility to God. And discipleship is my responsibility to you. So in the upper level, right, we have the encounter. And on the bottom level, we have the responsibility. Okay. And those things have to be in balance. So what happens when a church is out of balance? Just like what happens to a body when it's out of balance? What happens to a church when the church is out of balance? If we need worship and fellowship and stewardship and discipleship and all those things have to be in balance to have a healthy organization, when it's out of balance, what does it look like? Well, unbalanced worship leads to what uh, Pastor Ward used to call spiritual constipation. 
Mm -hmm. Unbalanced, unbalanced worship, worship. Well, where all people do is just go to church all day to get their hoop on to get their praise on and all they do is just sit there and eat it eat it eat it drink it drink it drink it in all the time i just go to church and get fat on the holy ghost when you when when your worship experience degenerates to that point and that's the main portion of your diet you can get worship overload that leads to spiritual paralysis but if all you're doing all day long is just taking it in and you're not giving it back out, then you get spiritually constipated. That's how we ended up with monks. They sit around all day, read and pray. Right? What happens when the church is out of balance? Unbalanced fellowship turns the church into a country club. So... You know, you know some churches, you can go to some churches, and they are the friendliest church of the world to the people who go to that church on a regular basis. Because they know all the inside. They know where the fellowship meals are. They get invited to all the things. But if you just happen to be a regular old person who comes to the church sometime or a visitor, you don't get in on that inside track. And so therefore, uh, you, you feel, feel very, very isolated, isolated that church is not for you. This There's a small, small church, church in my town here in Huntington, New York. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great little church. But when I was uh, down there at Oakwood, my wife was attending that church on a regular basis. She would go there uh, pretty frequently, maybe twice a month, and she would visit other churches. But in the whole time she was visiting that church in about three years, right, uh, they, they had fellowship dinner downstairs, downstairs but, they but they never invited her downstairs for fellowship dinner. Matter, matter of fact, she had been going to that church for a whole year before she even knew that there was a fellowship dinner <laughs> in church after Sabbath. She didn't even know. Why? Because the fellowship was for the fellowship of only those who were in the inside track. Uh, the church almost became like a speakeasy where you have to know the secret knock on the door in order to get in. You have to know the right people in order to be able to fit into that church. So when there's too much fellowship and that becomes unbalanced, then the church becomes a country club for me, mine, us four, and no more. It becomes a place where we feel comfortable with ourselves. And in churches like this, you will often see that there is no growth. And why do you think that is? Why is there no growth in churches like this? They're too exclusive. Too exclusive. But why are they? Why are they so exclusive? I mean, it's obvious that, that as what you're telling us, we need to have the balance. So they're they're, they're focusing on one of the quadrants only, and that's not going to help the church to grow. It has to have the balance of all four, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me tell you this, though. Some, Some churches, churches are like this because they really don't want to grow. Hmm. Right? Um, they are focused here because they have determined that this is the church and it doesn't need to be anything else other than this. So, so sometimes, sometimes you go to a country club church, church and you talk about uh, uh, things, things like evangelism. You say, well, can't we do a little evangelism at the country club church? We'll say, well, why, why, do we, why do we want to do evangelism? Or uh, the pastor will baptize uh, 20 people and the country club church will say, uh, the pastor's out here bringing all these strange people up in here. These people don't know Jesus. These people are not ready. These people are not ready. And the pastor's just bringing these, these people up in here. Well, of course, he's bringing strange people to the church. <laughs> That's why it's a church. <laughs> you need to bring strange people to the church. You want the church to grow. But the pastor's bringing strange people into the house of God who don't quite fit. They're not ready yet. Uh, and, that and that usually is a sign that the church is a country club that they like who they are. They don't want somebody else coming in and upsetting the apple cart. They feel comfortable with each other. Right? What happens when a church is out of balance? Well, unbalanced discipleship 
is what I call occultic brainwashing. What do I mean by that? Why do you think I say unbalanced discipleship? Too much discipleship can turn into uh, cultic brainwashing. And I want to take a wild stab at it. Um, is it because the focus is just on if people are only focused on bringing people in, but not, I don't know, not interested in them as a person once they get in or interested in being active in the community? People could look at you as just trying to get numbers and that makes people feel uncomfortable. Yeah, well, I, th I think I think you're right. One of the things that happens in unprincipled discipleship, not discipleship, but unprincipled discipleship, is that they're so busy trying to get you to believe a set of precepts or doctrines or whatever else it is that they're trying to teach you, that those other elements, like fellowship, is missing. Worship is missing. So that now the teacher becomes the focus. Uh, you know, um, all of us have been to churches, perhaps, where you've seen um, an elder or a Sabbath school teacher who has um, his class under his control, or under her control, right? Where they are standing there from week to week and they are teaching certain things and outlining certain principles. And after a while, that whole class seems to be just a little bit strange, just a little bit off. The doctrine seems to, to, to somehow veer off in, in, in a different direction. And so sometimes that's the indication that perhaps uh, the, that, that organizational unit is not balanced. That uh, the teacher and what he thinks and what he or she believes becomes the standard for what constitutes that group. So unprincipled discipleship can lead to cultic brainwashing. For example, David Koresh. Uh, we all know that David Koresh uh, had a seven day in his background. Right? David Koresh loved to teach the book of Daniel and Revelation. Most of the people who found themselves in David Koresh's compound were seven day Adventists. And they spent all day long studying, studying, studying. Ultimately, you know what happened. You know, his studying had them so much under his control that it ultimately led to their demise as well as his demise, right? Culture brainwashing. What happens when the church is out of balance? When the church goes out of balance, that's not what happens when the church goes out of balance. Where are you? Okay. Give me a minute. I know. I know we're in here somewhere. There you go. When you have imbalanced stewardship, unprincipled stewardship leads to dictatorship. Why do I say that? Unprincipled stewardship leads to dictatorship. Dictatorship. What is a steward? What is a steward? I think uh, uh, a steward is someone who's in. Go ahead, Uba. A steward is someone who's entrusted with entrusted with uh, taking care of something, right? Property, money. Yes. Does the steward own anything? No. Mm -hmm. Right. So, what so what happens when you have unprincipled stewardship? The steward does what he wants to do with what he has. The steward does what he or she wants to do. And so this unprincipled stewardship can easily lead to dictatorship. When the steward stops realizing that all things are owned by God and that he or she is just given the trust of it, 
where they, where they begin, begin to own it like it's theirs, theirs then, then it can lead to dictatorship. dictatorship. Oftentimes, Oftentimes, when you can take a look at a church, church administration, administration uh, you, you find, find this over and over again in one department, department in particular. Right? right? Which, Which department do you find this in over and over again? Treasury. Treasury. The treasury. Yeah. I mean, okay, I love treasuries. Praise God for treasuries, right? Um, the, ones the ones who can count the money and keep us all on track and all the rest of that. But sometimes the treasurer begins to think that that it is his money or her money and not the church's money. They lose sight of the fact that they are just stewards of that which has been entrusted to them. So sometimes they sit down and they have they say, no, we can't do this. Well, you can say, no, we can't do this, but on the basis of what? Right? right? We don't, we don't have, have the money. Well, well I'm going to ask you if we had the money. I, I, I asked you whether or not uh, 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 we could start a project. I didn't ask you if we had the money. Right? Or if I'm throwing an idea and someone says we don't have the money, I didn't ask you for them. I'll give you an example. Right? Um, my church, we started in January. We were feeding 50 people. Now we're feeding 500 families per week. Just in the last four months, from 50 people, the 500 families. That means we're feeding about 2,000 people per week, right? From 50 people per week, 2,000 people. I said, well, look, Pastor, we can't do this because we don't have the money. I said, God said we ought to do this. On what basis, Pastor? Because our church is in balance. How do you say our church is in balance? Our church is in balance because we're spending too much time thinking about ourselves. We spend too much time in the sanctuary worshiping and not enough time discipling and being good stewards of that which God has given to us. We spend too much time fellowshipping with ourselves and not enough time fellowshipping outside the doors of the church. They ran out of one side of me and they ran down the other side and said, Pastor, we'll never be able to do this. I said, God gave me a dream. So it must be crazy, Pastor. I said, yeah, no, I'm not crazy. God gave me a dream. In my dream, God said, go out by means and rights and give it to the people. Don't you know they stepped in and they voted me down? To give beans and rice to hungry people during the time of pandemic? They voted it down? But you know what I did? I went, I went and bought the beans and rice anyhow. Mm -hmm. and, then and then they said, well, well, how are you going to pay for this? I said, don't worry about how we're going to pay for it. The church can't afford this. I didn't ask you if the church could afford this, right? Because I understand that you're holding on to the money like you own the money. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. When you begin to understand that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, then you begin to understand that money is just a resource that comes from God as you need it. Amen. Yes. So, so we, we start, start the program, program. And, don't and don't you know, know, don't, know, you know don't you know, don't you know, that every, every time we spend a dollar, dollar we got a dollar. Every, every time we spend a dime, dollar, we, got we got another dime. dime. So, so that after a while, we had spent twenty thousand dollars, and the and the church said to me, "You're spending the church's money." I said, "I haven't spent a dime of church's money because I said every time we put out a dime, we get a dime back. We ended up with more money than what we had spent." They said, you can't do this program. You don't have the resources, don't you know? Now, every week, we get about 20,000 pounds of food, and it doesn't cost us a dime. You know why? Because, because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But when you have this unprincipled stewardship, you have some people who will use that in the church to control and to stop every bit of forward progress. So... Uh, look for that, that in, in your in your church, right? Anybody, Anybody got that going on or have seen, seen that? that? Yeah, I, I, I see it all the time, and that's why when you ask the question, I said treasury. <laughs> I see it quite often in board meetings when we try to do something, and the treasurer like, we don't have the money, we can't do it, we can't do it, we can't spend it, you know. So there's always a but when we want to move ahead in ministry, you know. So it's always a challenge, you know. So, oh yeah. You know what? Wait, were you? you know what? Okay. This is also bad, doctor. When when you have a uh, a group of family in the church that have important um, um, positions in the church, like the first elder, the treasurer, and the director of Sabbath school are in the same family, and they, they want to take control of the church, and it has to be done what they say. I've seen that happen. 
and it's like yes, a dictatorship, yes. you know, and you can't fight them because there's just too many and they have a lot of influence, you know. But, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, well, you know what? You said you can't fight them, right? Uh, what you can do is begin to ask the question about where the imbalance is and then begin to address, to address the imbalance in the system. That's what you can do. Okay? I, I think I think the assignment that you gave was just going to help me. It's going to help me help the church, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think so too. That's why I gave it to you. <laughs> All right. So, so, so we have to really examine ourselves to see whether or not we're in the faith to see whether or not we're balanced to check ourselves. We need to check the vital signs of our church. Right? So here's how you know if your church is out of balance. Right? When folks come to church to hide their sins. Mm-hmm versus sharing their faith, then you know your church is out of, out of balance. Check the vital signs of your church. When a church is more concerned about how much money they make versus how many souls they save, then the church is out of balance. Check the vital signs. When the church church spends spends more time time celebrating celebrating their past past, rather than than visioning their their future, future, then the church church is out of balance. balance. Check Check the vital signs. signs. When the church church has has more members members in the cemetery cemetery than in the pew, pew, then the church church is out of balance. Check, Check the vital signs. signs. When, when the, the doors, doors are locked more than the doors are open, then the, the church, church is out of balance. It, can it, anybody here resonate with what I'm standing right, right now? Right? Right? Most, Most of our, of our church, church doors are locked more, more than they're, they're open. open. Most, Most of the time, time when, you when you go to a board meeting, the discussion is, let's talk about the finances. Let's talk about the budget. Let's not talk about the mission. And whether, and whether or not we're on track with mission, mission mm-hmm. the church, church is out of balance. balance. We're, we're more concerned, concerned about church renovation than, than we are about life restoration, restoration then the then church, the church is, is out of balance. balance. Some churches spend hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars renovating their sanctuary. sanctuary. For what? So, so that the few people can sit in the church and feel comfortable and say, look at the great Babylon that I have built. Look at my beautiful country club for me, mine, us four, and no more. Look at how we come in here and how we worship God in this beautiful place. Right? Preach it, doctor. <laughs> Let's check the Bible signs. Right? Your church is out of balance when... The cheerleaders are saying, you go, Pastor, you go, Pastor. You know we support you 100%. Watch out when people say you go, Pastor, because that means that they're not working. <laughs> they're not even on the playing field. They just expect you to do all the work. So when we have more people cheering you, right, than ones who are on the battlefield, then you end up with a church full of critics who are always screaming at the television set, can't you ever get it right, Pastor? Can't that department ever get it right? Well, the reason why they're asking the questions is because they're not the one who's playing the game. If they were on the field and playing the game, if they were involved, the church would be more healthy. But instead, they're probably the ones either holding the dollars or they're probably the ones who are falling out of fellowship. Um, I have a situation in, in a church that I know about where there are several young people who just do not engage with the church at all. They just do not engage with the church at all. They sit back and they criticize the church all the time. I said, well, listen, why don't you go get yourself involved in the church, right? If you go and you begin to integrate in the fellowship, participate in the worship, right? Uh, involve yourself in the management and train others, the church dynamic will change. But instead, instead, people people choose to sit out and they they criticize criticize the church. That's That's why you know and how you know the church is out of balance. When When all the church church wants to do is shout, but not not reach between the porch and the altar, then the church is out of balance. 
you go to, you go to some, some churches, churches where, where that worship, worship dynamic, dynamic is the is the, the, is the dynamic. dynamic. So, so uh, people go to church, and if, and if the music is right, right and the sermon is on it, people are jumping up and they're praising the Lord and carrying on. But don't let a different preacher come into the church on that week. And it's, and it's not, not who they're used to be listening to. People, people will get up and they'll walk, walk out of church, church before the sermon, sermon even starts. Hmm. Let, let, let them walk the into church one Sabbath and, and the praise team is not there. And uh, somebody, somebody is going to stand up this week and sing hymns. They, they will get up and walk, walk out, out of the church. church. Because, because for them, that worship segment is way out of balance and they've got it twisted. They think that worship is only about getting their praise on. They think, they think the worship, worship is about only getting their shout and the hallelujah on. They, they neglect to understand that, that worship is the way that we live our lives 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when that does not happen, then the church is out of balance. Right? When the church is more concerned about how we dance than how we walk, the church is out of balance. Right? When, when the, the preacher, preacher is exalted, these, these are some of the greatest preachers in in in, in America. You have, have Joel Osteen, uh, Calvin, Calvin Butts, Benny Hinn, Hinn Creflo Give Me Your Dollar, T.D. T. 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 Jakes, and Dedrick Blue, the greatest preachers of all time. Dedrick Blue, the greatest preachers of all. Anyway, but when the preacher is exalted above the Word of God then the church is out of balance. Why? Because at that point, you have that unbalanced discipleship, where now that discipleship centers around a man and his ideology and his philosophy and his theology and not around the word of God. So you have that imbalance in the system and the church is out of balance. So it is that the church must be balanced to be healthy. And there's some very, very sick churches, right? Right? You don't have to be sick, right? Not to have optimal health. The church is not in optimal health because we are not in optimal health. So the church is the macrocosm of what we are in the microcosm. So we need to always, first of all, in, in examining, examining ourselves, ourselves and examining the church, let's look inward. In, in your research, research of what you're going to be doing in terms of looking at your church, think not just in, in, in the, the church in terms of the macro, think of the church in terms of the micro. One of the reasons, for example, I want you to do some demographics and just dig underneath the surface a little bit. Because, because by digging underneath the surface a little bit, you get a better idea as to who is in your church and where they where they are hurting and, and what needs to be scratched. Because sometimes churches are out of balance because they're so busy following the, the, the traditional way that they have done it or following an organizational structure that does not meet the needs of the people that they find themselves out of balance. But... If, if they, they could adjust themselves, themselves and write the ship, the ship then, the, then, the, then, the, then the ship could uh, move forward. So search me, O God, and know my heart. To see if there be any wicked way in me. Lord, make me to know my end. Measure my days. To see how for examine me, Lord. Prove my reins and my heart. Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget. For if a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he ultimately deceives himself. So, so at the end of the day, here is a question for you as leaders. Right? The question for you is, are you out of balance? Because if you are out of balance, you cannot bring balance to the system. You don't have to be 100% in balance to bring balance, but you at least have to be able to recognize where you are out of balance. And be, and be able, able to, to go to God, to God and say, God, bring me back into that balance so that I might be able to bring balance to the people who you have called me to lead. So let me conclude with this. We have the spiritual, the social, the physical, and the mental. That's, That's who we are in the microcosm. When we are out of balance, then we become sick. The same is true 
inside, inside of the church, church where, where we, we have, have the mental, mental physical, the social, and the spiritual represented in the worship, the fellowship, the stewardship, and the discipleship. All the activities of the church will take place in one of these four arenas. However, if the church is not in balance, We see that unbalanced worship, where all we do is praise all day long, leads to spiritual constipation. We take it in, but we don't give it out. Unbalanced fellowship turns the church into a country club. Be mine, us four, and no more. Unbalanced discipleship turns it into cultic uh, brainwashing. We you have one or two people who are leading the congregation, but it is not a balanced lead. So therefore, their ideologies and their philosophies dictate. And unbalanced stewardship leads to dictatorship, where a few people think that they have the right to own and control what passes through the church, and they become the ultimate arbiters for how things are dispersed and dispensed in the church. So, that, my friends, is what I call the quadrant system and checking your vital signs. Got any questions or comments? You, you will put this on D2L, right? So we can have it. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm going to work on that just as soon as I get off here and find out uh, what I did wrong. So why it's not showing up for you. So I will work on that. Yeah, you need this. Thank you. Yep. So. In terms, in terms of, of your, your ministry, ministry context, context, right? right? Um, if, if you were, were to uh, take, take a look, look at your, your church, church, the church that you're operating, operating in right now, and, and you, you would ask yourself, yourself the question, question where, where might be some, some of the imbalances? imbalances? Where, where might an imbalance be in your church? church? Can someone, someone give me a description of an imbalance that exists within, within your, your local, local congregation, congregation and um, how um, you, you see that, that imbalance? Um, in our church, like I said earlier, uh, the, the example that I put is actually something that's happening in our church with stewardship. Um, and it's not letting the church move forward because even though we may have a great idea even even though when the board has voted to do something there's this group of people that just kind of get in the way so that's that's one that, that's one of the things that we're dealing with in our church right now all right so you just have people who get in the way yes yes well here's what your assignment is right Assuming that, that there, there is no church, church that, it, that is completely balanced. balanced. There's no such thing as a completely balanced church. church. Evaluate, Evaluate your current church context using the quadrant model. What, what are, are the areas of the church's strength? strength? Does, Does the strength of your church rest within worship, fellowship, stewardship, or discipleship? Please describe what makes them strengths and how the church has capitalized upon those strengths. Um, one, one of the things that you also will see when you start to look at churches is that sometimes the greatest strength can also be the greatest weakness. Like the man who has these super muscles. Well, the man who has these super muscles is very, very well developed. But as someone has rightly said, it's creating a heart problem. He'll probably die um, of a heart attack very, very soon. Right. So, so sometimes, sometimes your greatest strength, strength can also be your greatest weakness. Right. So, so your uh, uh, great fellowship meals are great. great. It, could it could be a wonderful, wonderful strength. strength. But, but if they, they tend toward exclusion, exclusion, then it, then it could, could be a weakness. So, so describe, describe what those strengths are, how the church has capitalized upon those strengths. 
But then, but then what, what are the, the, the underdeveloped in the church? In the church? Is, is it the, the stewardship? stewardship? Is it the discipleship? Is it the, is it the worship? Please, Please describe and assess why you think that they are underdeveloped. And then, if you were leading the change process, what would you do to bring balance back to the system? What would you do to bring balance back to the system if you were leading the change process? That clear as mud? Yeah, I think one of the strengths in our church is, um, you know, socializing. Um, there's a lot of that, you know, I consider to be a very, very friendly church, but at the same time, like you said, I also consider as a weakness, you know. So, okay. this is, I'm glad I'm taking this class. Wow, this is awesome. <laughs> So, so, so you see it, it as a strength, but also as a weakness. Why, why is it a weakness? Because um, it's it's like most of the members focus on that. It's I I don't want to say I don't know how to say that it comes out good. Um, it's like I see it, and I've talked this. Uh, I'm an elder. I'm not the first elder, but I, I the first elder is my friend, and I talk to him a lot about it. Where I think like we entertain ourselves too much in the church when there's people out there that need us. Right now we have a church board, it's Thursday, and our pastor doesn't want to open the church, not even to to do the uh, uh, online uh, services like many churches are doing. And, and I'm telling them like, yeah, some people may go online on Sabbath, you know, and watch other churches program, but some don't. Some may even get up at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning and sleep all morning. But if we have the church open, you know, CDC let us, you know, gather 10 people or less with proper distancing. And there's some churches doing it. We can do the same thing. So so it's okay to socialize and get together at somebody's house. But it's not okay to, to gather 10, 12 people at the church on the Sabbath and have our own programming. We, ha we have the equipment. We have the ability. We have the talent. That's why I say that, you know, it's it's like, you know, it's like we're, we're entertaining ourselves so much and not focusing on, on, on the community and, and on the people that really need us, you know, because it's not the same. I, I don't feel it's the same. I, I mean, I, I, I watch different churches every Sabbath, but I, I want, I, you know, I want to go to church and I want to be able to be part of the programming, you know, as long as we keep distance and I can tell the pastor, the pastor like, oh, we don't want to get sick, you know, the conference and, but the conference has given us the okay to do it. So, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I, I hate being redundant, but I think this class is going to help me a lot because now I can professionally present the, the solution to the problem that we have, hopefully by the end of this class, you know, <laughs> and we can, we can balance the church because our church is really, really not balanced, you know. Well, well who, who else has, has a, who has, who has the, perfect the perfectly balanced, balanced church? church? Yeah. Yeah. Online tonight. Yeah. Who has a perfectly yeah. balanced church? Nobody, Nobody? If okay, you know, well, if you, if you don't, don't, let's, let's go, go around the round, round robin here, here right? right? And, and why don't you share, share with me um, an imbalance that you may have seen in your church? Can I call on somebody? All right, I'm calling Sister Francine. Francine. <laughs> I've actually seen um, and see probably two areas where we are imbalanced. And one is fellowship. We're not a very large church, and maybe about 68 members. And most of the time, there's only about 20, so 20, 20 and 25 members that show up. And we do tend to and in clickish, you know, uh, and I don't think we like that part. We're very friendly. We invite anybody that comes to like our fellowship dinner. We, you know, we're open, but. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, we're also not. Um, we're, we're being responsible to others, but we're not 
And that you're doing a lot of community service. Like you say, you're doing food, we're doing food, we're doing vegetables and all that sort of stuff. But as far as doing evangelistic work, or as talking to people, as far as checking on some of our members who and we're doing an um, online service, Facebook and whatever, but we don't have, uh, we have older people. It's an older congregation. And they're not able to uh, even use a telephone to do like a telephone uh, call in kind of thing. So they're missing out altogether. And then we're not exactly um, we're not exactly doing any kind of evangelistic outreach. You know, other than bringing food in and people are showing up and collecting. Well, you said you said a lot of very very significant things, um, which is one of the reasons why. Um, um, I want you to think about the demographics of the congregation. Because you said, for example, you have an older congregation, right? But we're not doing much evangelism. Well, in an older congregation, you may not get much evangelism going, traditional evangelism. Um, you said uh, also that fellowship is something that you all do, something that you enjoy doing. But you said something that was very, very significant, right? And here's how here's how strengths can also be witnesses. You said, however, we're very very friendly church. You know, whoever comes in is welcome. And so, you know, in a situation like yours, where perhaps you have an older congregation where you cannot do traditional evangelism, love can be your evangelist. You know, so even that thing that could appear to be a weakness can also be a great strength. Now, now you have to ask yourself the question, well, listen, if we're doing all this loving, how do we now convert this love into discipleship, to the people who we're giving meals to, the people who are coming to worship and fellowship with us? So in terms of thinking about balancing and writing your ship, I would think in terms of, okay, this is a strength, but there are other things that we can develop off of this. How do we surround that strength? With all the ministries to create that balance, so that's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Oh, you have a great church too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If I come, if I come there, they're gonna take, they're gonna feed me. Yes. Yes, we will. I'm coming. I'm coming. Okay. 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 Come, come. All right. All right, Sister so Joy, you got a church for us? Yes. Um, uh, our church is quite small um before covid we had 20 to 30 people that would attend regularly and maybe 10 to 15 would be baptized sda members so we're actually a company um not a church and we have a lay pastor um from the conference that's out here kind of like as a missionary type position um so one of our strengths is definitely fellowship and before covid we would have potluck every week um a lot of i call them community members the homeless individuals will come because they know we're going to eat every sabbath so fellowship was definitely one of our strengths um i'd say a weakness is discipleship um we actually had several several people for us being so small be baptized in the past couple of years but um, there's kind of like an expectation that people will pitch in where they need to and help out and volunteer for things, but um, that doesn't happen. And so the same couple of people that are responsive are asked to do a lot of the things. And there's kind of, I think, an attitude of people see there's work that needs to be done, so they should help do work, but... Um, with, with people, people being, being new to church, to church and even if people aren't new, new just, having just having jobs and other stuff, you do have to ask people to help or figure out why they're not helping and you can't just expect that they will. But I don't see that happening. So I see a couple of people being asked to do everything, <laughs> myself being one. So our pastor will, you know, sometimes ask me to speak to someone else that they want to see a change happen or something like that so i've started saying no because i don't want to be a go-between and i don't think that's my job and i think that's part of discipleship you know that you need to go figure out the reason so and so isn't doing something and don't ask me to do it so i think in a discipleship especially 
um, just, just being, being like a really, really diverse church, church and, and with a lot of people being new, new Adventists. Adventists. And not, and not having, having the same expectation, and some of our older, older Adventists being from a different, different culture, culture, that um, um, there's just some, some issues, there issues there with discipleship and people, people knowing, knowing how, a how a church operates, operates and getting involved. Let me ask you a question. Um, do you think the congregational size has an impact upon these dynamics? Does congregational size have an impact upon these dynamics? So for example, uh, you say that uh, in this small church you're doing a lot of things. Would it matter if you were a big church or is this just the way that things operate? Do you think the congregational size impacts this at all? Um, yes, I think it impacts it because there, um, there's less people to, to draw from, um, for one thing, and there's also less people Able, able to, to financially, financially support, support. Um, and, and I mean, it all just kind of comes, comes together. together. I think I also the fact that we're a company may have, may have something, something to do with it too, too because I mean, I mean, if you if you really want to like pin pinpoint pin something, you can always say, well, actually, this, this should be something the conference should do. <laughs> if you wanted to keep going there because it's not, you know, actually the same setup as when you have a pastor. So I think size definitely does impact it. Even with that, we're able to do, I think, quite a bit for being so small, but... Um, I see, I see we'll, we'll have, have people, people join, join and then they just, they just kind of, you know, just you know, sit there. Yeah. I don't know. It's but, weird. But, but, you know, um, um, I, asked, I asked the question because it really is uh, differences in congregational dynamics based upon size. So the zero to 100 size church will operate differently from the 100 to 300 size church. The uh, 300 and 500 church will operate differently than those congregations that are over 500. So, for example, the 0 to 100 church tends to be a family church dominated by one or two families who are the main families who pretty much control just about everything that transpires. Um, when you get over 100, 100, 300, then you have, it can still be a family church, but now you have usually have groups of families or dynamic groups that are working in constant, usually maybe two or three of them, but still controlling everything. 300 to 500, then you start to get a little bit more diversity. You start to have departments who are leading the direction, right? So but by the time you get to uh, over 500 in terms, in terms of the congregation, congregation then you start to really uh, jump into a different kind of political dynamic where you have political factions who are vying for power, who have their seats and their representatives who are sitting on the board to help make policy and decisions. So the smaller the church, the more direct impact and influence um, you have from a few key leaders and a few families. All right. All right. Thank you. Great, Great insights. insights. All right. All right. Jonathan, Jonathan, I haven't heard voice. your voice. How are you? Good. Listen, listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Understand, 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 Okay. okay. All right. All right. So, so, if you understand, right, right um, is, is is your church? What is, what is the strength of your church? church? Is it is worship, worship, fellowship, stewardship, or discipleship? It's to the church. Is a my church is a university Oku. Hola, hola, Hispani. So, so is a uh, uh, student. Everything, everything is student uh, for top uh, for this party, uh, uh, the university, university and go to Ola. Go to Ola. The church Ola. 
I want you to continue to, to think about this and, and think about what strengths your church has and what are its weaknesses in terms of looking at these models. Then Uba, tell us about your situation. Yes, yeah, so my church, on the, on the books, I think we're about 400 members, uh, but the number of people who actually show up is like 150. So my church, uh, in terms of the age, I'll say the average age is probably like 60. It's an older church, um, mostly 70% uh, Jamaican, um, others from Trinidad and other countries, African American. Um, so probably, probably African Americans, Americans probably represent like five percent, I'll say. Um, the strength of my church, I'll say, I'll say is fellowship. Um, they believe, they believe so, much so much in fellowship, whether it's fellowship, fellowship Sabbath, Sabbath, lunch, lunch or ways, ways to bring in the community. Um, we do a, we do a lot of events, events just to be able to interact with our community. Uh, so, uh, so I'll say fellowship will be, will be a strength of the, of the church in terms of imbalance. Um, Worship, worship uh, because, uh, because the majority, majority of the members, of the members are culturally, culturally conservative. conservative. The older, the older folk, they have, they have the younger people who are, who are in the minority. minority. So, so one thing, thing I, I do observe in my church is, uh, in, terms in terms of the worship, of the worship um, if, it's if it's a young person leading out in the worship and getting, and getting the church engaged, engaged, a lot of older, older people are not engaged at all because they, they just, just are, not are not into, into that, style that style of worship, you know, you know so they, they sit down, down they don't sing, sing you know, it's, it's they, they, they are not, are not connected, connected to it. To it. And, and I also know this because whenever an older, an older person is leading worship and it's basically hymns, hymns and, the older, and the older people are into the hymn singing, singing, you know, so that has caused Imbalance, imbalance in my church and also, and also here's, a, here's a question there's a question for you yes, yes. Okay, right. that, that imbalance right, right is, it is it a worship, worship issue is it a fellowship issue is it a discipleship issue is it a stewardship issue where where where, where is, the is the crux of that issue um, I think a part of it also is discipleship or understanding of what worship is. Because I've spoken to some people who don't buy the type of worship of the younger people, and they're saying that that's not the way I was raised. And I think biblically, uh, worship should be this way. And a lot of times, sometimes it has to do with tradition or what they're used to, I guess, growing up. So it's, so it's their understanding and their conviction that worship has to be this way. And this is the way I was raised or the way I was taught. So anything that goes outside of the way I see worship cannot be worship. So it's a discipleship issue, right? Correct. It's a discipleship issue, but it's also, it's also a fellowship issue. You know, why do I say it's a fellowship issue? Class. Why do I say it's a fellowship issue? Why? Why? Why is, Why is it a fellowship issue? Because it's concentrating just on fellowship and ignoring the other three, or nope, no, that's not why. And no. because it's kind of social, based on um, what they're used to, as he said, and um, who they associate with. Yep, 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 yep. Because, because what, it, what is, it is, you just, you just described it there's a there's a there's a, 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 a split in the church, right? Yes. 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 Older, older and the younger ones, ones right? So, so the right. older ones tend to fellowship within their circle, circle not bridging beyond their, their circle. And so, and so actually, right. fellowship is not as as wholesome as it might appear to be on the surface. That's why, That's why we go and start looking, looking at church. You can't just judge a church based on whether or not they have fellowship dinner. Right? right? You, want you want to know how, how what a church is really like in terms of fellowship? Go sit, Go sit down, down to fellowship dinner, dinner and see who eats with whoever else. Then you know about, about right? See, see who is present and who, and who chooses, chooses to be absent. Correct. Correct. Then you can know more about the fellowship, right? right? And then and see how that plays out in terms of what happens, in terms of evangelism, in terms of worship, in terms of all the other elements and things that are going on in the church. So don't judge the church just based upon its external activities. Look beyond and pull back and see those relationships. That's why earlier when I was talking about the whole issue of ethnicity, 
right? right? Ethnicity. Ethnicity. Um, um, we have, we have a, couple a couple of brothers here, here who are um, Hispanic, Hispanic, so they'll, they'll perhaps know exactly, exactly what I'm saying when I say this. Right? right? Um, um, I, have I have discovered in my walk that Dominicans and Puerto Ricans don't get along. Right? Right? I have, I have discovered, discovered that that, that um, uh, uh, Puerto, uh, Puerto Ricans and Mexicans, and Mexicans don't, don't like each other, and, and that Central, Central Americans and South, South Americans don't, don't all the time get the same, the same space in brotherhood, in brotherhood and, love and love and harmony. Right? right? And, that's and that's because, because not because people don't speak, speak the same language, language but, because but because these are different ethnicities, ethnicities with different, different cultures. cultures. And sometimes, and sometimes we tend to gravitate toward our own culture and to stay within the parameters of that culture. And it does impact the way that the church operates in terms of fellowship, right? So in my church, my church is like 95% Jamaican, about maybe 4.5% or more Antiguan, and about 0.2% American. I'm the 0.2%, me and my wife are about the 0.2% native-born um, African-American. So... Uh, we, have we have to, to think, think a lot about, about culture and how that works. So, so what, I what I want to do is, in this, in this particular assignment, I want you to think, think about your church sort of and sort of assess it in the light of those, in the light of this model. model. Don't, Don't just, just look, look at the, at the surface, surface and say, oh, we, oh, we get, get together for fellowship. fellowship. Ask, Ask yourself a different, different question. question. If we're getting together, what does that look like? What does it mean? Not just, Not just to say everybody, everybody comes to church and we worship, and we worship but, but how are we worshiping? Is it, is it truly authentic worship or are we just simply following the prescribed order of things that we have always done it this way and there's nothing vitalizing or transformative in our worship because we're so stuck on the doctrines that we forgot about God, right? Or, or don't, don't just judge stewardship by how much tithe and offering comes into offering. the offering plate. Instead, Instead ask, ask yourself the question, question are, people are people being wise stewards, stewards of that which God, God has entrusted us to? It's not, it's not just tithe and offering, is it, right? I think the Francine earlier was talking about the time, the talent, the treasure, and the body temple. Are we being wise stewards of everything that God has placed within our hands and within our means? So, so when you, when you can begin, begin to ask those kinds of questions, questions you begin to can see whether, see whether or not this church is balanced or imbalanced. Or imbalanced. And, this and this is just one way of helping you to see a church. church. We'll, give we'll give you many more ways to help you to look, look at a church, to evaluate, to evaluate a church. When I, when I walk into a church, I tell you, I'll walk into a church, I'll look around. I want to see the age. I'm listening for the actions of the people who are in the church. I'm watching, I'm watching the leaders who are up front. I'm listening, I'm listening to what they say and how they say it. Because, because at the end of the day, I'm taking, taking an evaluation of that church. church. If, I if I go to a church, church, to a church on a Sabbath morning, by the time I leave that church on Sabbath, Sabbath afternoon, I know, I know that church. <laughs> I, know I know the church. Because, because I'm asking myself these kinds of key questions, which are the key questions that you want to ask. Because one day, it's going to be you who's leading the ministry, or you who is the pastor of the church, so, so start, start to ask these questions. questions. Now, now, I'm going to I'm make certain, this, this, this is dropped online, online in, the, in, the, in, the in the area, area that says, says um, assignments, assignments, but I will email, email this, to this to you. I'm, 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 I will email, email this to make sure that you get it, all right? All right? And, and I will repost this presentation to make sure that you get this as well, because you can't do the assignment without it. In the, in the meantime, meantime please start on that first, first assignment, which is uh, going, going to your church, church talking, talking to the pastor, and start, and start to collect that information about the history, the history of the church, church the demographics of your church, and those, those and those things, things so, that so that you can you begin to start thinking, thinking about, about your church slightly differently. So you have, so you have any questions for me, anything that I can, can do, do for you or help you in some sort of way? That would make this uh, more meaningful for you. I think Miss I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say that I, I think he explained it very well. Um, okay. I understand. So I'm checking your Bible signs and reflection. You want us to do two pages on this? Yes. You want us to turn it in? Um, yes. Yes. When? <laughs> Whenever or when? Well, listen. I'm not. Listen. I'm not. I'm not going to stress you. 
about, about I just, I just, just want to see that you that you that you do it because by doing it, it, it just sort of helps you. Usually, if you can get it done within a week, that's good. But if you don't, then it's okay. The main thing is I want you to do it because it helps you. Then that me helps you. So you know. Yeah, the, 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 the one thing I have discovered, discovered in terms of dealing with uh, students who, who are a little older, you know, I don't, I don't believe in dealing with, with um, adult learners the same way that I would deal with a student who's an undergraduate because um, you all are at different ages and stages of your life, right? You are already self-motivated. If you weren't self-motivated, you wouldn't be here, right? So, so, you know, you know get, get, just, just, just get, get it done within, within the context of your life situation, situation right? right? Knowing, Knowing that, that as you do it, it it's, it's expanding your ability to understand and to, and to incorporate the information that we share. Right? Right? Yes, this yes. joy. joy, I saw your hand. It's the, it's the reflection paper of the strengths, strengths and, weaknesses and weaknesses of our church, church based, based off the four quadrants, or is it um, six? Demographic thing. No, it's based upon the four quadrants. It's based upon the four quadrants. So I want you to, to do this one based upon those four quadrants the worship, fellowship, stewardship, and discipleship. Right? The, the other things about the demographics, as you look at the demographics and those other things, it will continually inform you as we look at other aspects of the church. So if, for example, you're looking at these quadrants and you know something about the demographics, that makes sense, sense to you within this model, then by all means mention it, right? right? So, so I'm, not I'm not telling you don't use it, use it but I'm not but looking for that here. here. I'm, just I'm just looking, looking for your just quick and, quick quick and dirty, dirty assessment, assessment. Quick a quick and dirty assessment of, of, of uh, your, church your church situation. situation. Well, well, I'd like to thank you all very much for your time. It is 8.02. I don't, I don't wanna I know I know, I know you spent such a wonderful, wonderful two hours with me. It just seemed like it went by in just a minute, minute. Didn't it? Yes. Say yes, say yes, yes. Dr. Blue. It seemed like we were just a minute. Yes, yes. 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 Time flies we having fun. See see how see see how I brainwashed you. See that's that's unprincipled that's unprincipled discipleship. I just brainwashed you. Into my, into my cult. cult. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen. Well, listen um, as soon as, soon as, as, soon as I get offline, I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'll make sure that I like, email this assignment to you and I'll fix that thing and and, um, and so that you can access it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, well, well uh, Jonathan, I know, I know, I know, I know that, uh, you, don't that uh, you, you don't speak English very well, so you can pray for us. Right. right. You can pray, you can for, pray for us in English. English. You can pray, you can pray, pray for, for us in Spanish. Spanish. <laughs> so we, believe, we, believe, we believe that you know how to get a prayer up to God. So please pray for us. Okay. Okay. Uh, pray. Pray. Uh, Inspire you. You know. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, Padre bueno, como en los cielos. Agradecemos eh, esta clase. Thank you for this class. Uh, uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity uh, for studying, studying together. Uh, ayúdanos a poder comprender todas estas materias y que lo podamos hacer, hacer bien eh, en tu nombre. Señor, bendice cada uno de los presentes. Bless you, everyone. Uh, y al finalizar esta esta, esta clase, clase que podamos encontrar que hemos, que hemos estado lleno de conocimientos y hemos, y hemos estado más cerca de ti bendícenos a cada uno en lo particular a, la, a nuestras familias y en especial al profesor al doctor que nos pueda ayudar a proyectarnos hacia adelante los ubicamos en tu nombre Señor en tu nombre Jesus praise, amen, amen. amen. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Yeah. All right. All right. Well, God, God bless you all, and have a blessed week. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and do you all have my phone number too? In case you need to call me. Yes, it's in the cell. Yes. Okay. All right. Don't hesitate. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Take care. All right.